Welcome to devmode.fm, a podcast dedicated to the tools, techniques, and technologies used in modern web development. I'm Andrew Welch from NY Studio 107. I'm Jonathan Melville from MDD in Atlanta. I'm Patrick Harrington from Mildly Geeky in Boston. And today, we are going to be talking to Dominic Wilkowski. How did I do, Dominic? Sounds all right to me. Sounds all right? Okay. <laughs> from Think Mill. And we are going to be talking about modern design systems, right? And first of all, I want to say, Dominic, thank you very much for getting up this early. What time is it, your local time? Now it's 5.04 a.m. 5.04 a.m., ladies and gentlemen. That's the time that he got up for tomorrow? you. Tomorrow? And Yeah, 5.04 a.m. tomorrow. Oh. He's in Australia. Yeah. Wow. On a Saturday. Has the Mueller report come out yet? <laughs> uh, no? I haven't checked okay. it. What are the winning right. lottery numbers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, thank you for being here on the, the correct day. I got a, a frantic tweet from you like a couple of weeks ago where you're like, you're like, oh, you know, when does this thing start? Right. Yeah, that was pretty hilarious. I had <laughs> I had another talk scheduled on the same day and I friendly rechecked uh, probably about four times that it's exactly on that same day. And I do have to get up in it, all these kind of things. I've never once questioned that the podcast might be on a different day. Mm. So yeah, I had an early start. Yeah, I remember you tweeted at me, and I was, <laughs> I was just like, um, I feel bad that you got up at four thirty a.m. for no reason. <laughs> uh, but apparently, you went for a nice run, and, and everything worked out okay, right? Yeah, soft sand run it was perfect. So the sunset, nothing was wasted. So why don't you tell us real quick a little bit uh, briefly about Think Mill, and then briefly about what you do at Think Mill, and then we'll dive in. Yeah, oh, sure. Um, uh, Thinkmill is essentially a development company that has a strong focus on design and development. We have a bunch of awesome people working uh, for us. And my title, I believe, is a people director. People we, director. All that's right. definitely something we can make fun of. Are you HR or what? Yeah, what does that mean? It's quite interesting. I have actually, we've we've honed in on exactly what that means. And it comes down to a single sentence. I'm just supposed to make people happy. That is literally my KPI and ream of things. Is that customers? Is that internal developers? Uh, who are you? Ma or, or anyone? You're, you just need to make everyone happy. <laughs> no, it's the internal developers. Okay. All right. That helps. Sounds like a fluffer. <laughs> Are you well, the one giving yeah. the free office massager? <laughs> uh, no, because that's also part of HR problems, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's like um, senior developers these days are not chosen by companies. The com uh, company doesn't choose senior developers. It's the senior developers that choose companies. Um, there's a mm. lot of mm. demand and we just make sure that everyone is happy and it and increases productivity and financials very significantly. That's a, so what does your day look like? I mean, you know, without getting to specific people or scenarios, but yeah, what, what do you, what, what do you do all day? Well, way too much is the first answer. <laughs> Um, the, I'm, I'm doing a lot of one-on-ones, so uh, I have fortnightly one-on-ones with every single one in the company, mm -hmm. um, I, which is not scalable. That's also sort of uh, moving into other people's dreams now. We we actually just yesterday uh, set up a, a counseling uh, hotline for everyone in the company that is completely mm -hmm. anonymous, uh, and we set up a lot of information so people don't have to ask for how to get there because that sort of spoils that someone mm. may want to talk to a counseling service and they, that's, and yeah. And maybe a barrier for them to even seek help. Exactly. And then we go to a lot of Marvel movies, really. Yeah, I mean, uh, our friend of the show, Simon Swiss, works there and he can't say enough good things about the environment there. Uh, he just absolutely loves it and is constantly learning stuff and he's also constantly going on about some gelato truck or something that shows up every now and again. <laughs> What, now we what have, is that? 
Yeah, that's <laughs> that's one of the things. That's one of the perks. I would I would say it's actually one person, uh, Thomas Walker, that uh, works at home and he's built uh, or bought these huge machines for gelato because it's one of his hobbies and he creates professionally amazing artisan uh, gelato and brings it into the office and he's got his own fridge and uh, he's experimenting with uh, flavors. It's absolutely amazing. All right. Well, uh, enough about the wonderfulness that is Think Mill, and it makes me jealous to, yeah. to hear about all this. Stuff. I mean, seriously, no one, no one brings me gelato. Uh, let me just okay. tell you something, Patrick. No one's bringing gelato down to the barn while I'm down here working. Yeah, I just had three Hershey <laughs> kisses after lunch because I'm trying to watch my weight, and uh, yeah, just gelato. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you know, um, <laughs> so Dominic, different. so Dominic, if you rode your one wheel out by the Kamigawa River. While you're searching for suisekis along its lovely banks <laughs> in Kyoto, Japan, and someone came up to you and said, "You know, what is a, a modern design system, and what kind of tooling should I use?" I mean, what would you say? That's a that's a good question. Uh, um, well, I I would say in an, in a short sentence, a design system is your digital brand that usually at least hits most of the marks. Um, it's really important that we do talk about what a design system is because a lot of people have different ideas and opinions about it and we just need to align ourselves before we have a yeah, discussion. I mean, we, did a pop, we did a podcast with Travis Gertz recently and basically everything was a design system, right? So we, we need to specify what type of design system we're talking about? Yeah, essentially. Like there's, there's patent libraries, which is probably what we're going to talk about today. But mm -hmm. to me, a design system is like an ecosystem of all the tools that uh, enable you to have your digital brand and enable you to deliver your digital brand uh, mm. to your customers, whatever that might look like. And that can be a patent library, that can be just a PDF with rules, um, which is essentially where we came from a couple of years ago, or it can be a multi-platform framework that allows you to have the source of truth of each of those components that you deem necessary in your design system and you can use them in different platforms like native but also on the web or uh, in emails i mean i've been reading a whole bunch on design systems in part just because everyone's talking about design systems and uh, you know like we discussed in our previous show you know it, it's a little nebulous in terms of defining what it is and in doing some of the research, one of the interesting things that I was reading in an article was that the designers that are typically doing the design for a website um, or the design for a web app or whatever, they're using a lot of the time they're using tools that are very far divorced from what the final thing mm -hmm. is going to end up being like. Right. I mean, it, it wasn't too long ago that you'd be handed, a, you know, a, a Photoshop file. Right from a designer, and they'd be like, "Okay, go ahead and make this." Not too right? long ago, <laughs> How about this well, morning. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it, it's it still happens. Oh yeah, right? yep. But the the whole the thing that really struck me about this article, and they they covered a whole bunch of different things, was how incredibly true it was that a lot of designers are they're using tools that have absolutely nothing to do with the final form that this thing will take, and that seemed a little crazy to me. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's exactly one of the things that we can address with uh, design systems. I'd say it's a it's one of those side effects that you then are able to work on if you have a system in place. And that's why all these tools that are coming out currently are web-based because it's supposed to use the actual thing. And you the translation layer between whatever you did in Photoshop to whatever you can do on the web has always been clunky. Um, and now we're trying to put the source of truth of the component that exists into the patent library. Yeah, Dominic, I mean, that's crazy because Patrick is telling me that he just got delivered a Photoshop file this morning, right? And yeah. it's twenty, it's 2019. There's got to be a better way that we can design this stuff, right? And, and even if it's not Photoshop, it, maybe it's Sketch, but still it, it, there's a lot different from how a Sketch library is put together versus something that's semantic and has something to do with what a button is or what a line is or, or what typography is. Well, even like, so Sketch is a little better because yeah. you can start embedding some development, you know, information in it. Yep. 
but I, I remember these days really well. Like, you know, my, my, my wife, who was a designer, would like hand me an Illustrator file or a PDF and be like, make this. And I'd be like, um, okay, <laughs> you know? And it just is crazy to me that the way everything works these days, or not everything, but the, the way that things have historically worked is that the systems that designers are using have absolutely nothing to do with the web like it, or app design. It just seems crazy. That is certainly a risk, right? Like it's one of those things where the communication loop between the designers and developers bears the risk of losing context that may have been important to the designer, but mm. got lost in translation. And now we end up with a subpar user experience or um, client experience, really. Right. So and I think, I think it makes the designers it makes the designers' job harder too, right? Because if they're trying to design something that will work really well responsively at different sizes, tablet, mobile, you know, whatever. It makes it really hard for them if they don't have a tool that lets them instantly, you know, relay things out and see things and even interact with things, right? Absolutely. It allows them, like for a designer, one of the challenges that I often uh, come across is design is such a vast field that it really benefits from having cornerstones to um, to basically direct your um, uh, creativity. Like you, if you look at a blank page, you can do a lot of stuff with it. But if you have a grid and if you have uh, specific things that you can't do, it narrows your field uh, and your focus to really just do the thing that you can do. And it sort of maybe gets rid of the writer's block or the designer block mm. if that's a thing and that's right. that's true for for the web like you have a different you have different kinds of tools and uh, little things that you can use to display things like a button comes with a specific idea already on the web and that gives you like this cornerstone of okay i'm going to work on this thing now and uh, i know at least the direction that i'm going into yeah for sure and one of the things that I'm really hopeful is that we're going to be able to bridge the gap where developer or designers are going to be able to work in a tool that they can instantly just like flick a switch and now it will act like a responsive web page, you know, and it will interact with their component library and, and can actually demo stuff right then and there. Is there anything like that already that does the, what we want in that way? Yeah, there's a bunch of things. There's, for instance, the the plugins into... Uh... Um, into Sketch, uh, where you can actually mm -hmm. use your React-based uh, design system um, mm -hmm. and and use the components uh, directly in there, and you click a button and you'll get the actual page out. But one thing that I've talked to a friend yesterday or two days ago is machine learning makes it much easier now to because it's again it's a narrower field. If you have a pattern library with a, a bunch of components, you can train your model. And uh, what they've been doing is they they started sketching like with a pen and paper what your website should look like. And you just do squares and you say, this is the button, blah, blah, blah. And you scan that in and give it to the computer. And the computer with its machine learning actually learns and understands what each of those little squares mean and create the HTML mm. for you because the HTML is embedded into the components. And now you can essentially build websites by drawing them. Yeah, and I think that's really neat. I wish it was something like, I, I tend to use Vue more than React, and I wish it was something available for Vue as well, or just, you know, or just something that works generically, right? But I don't, I don't really know how you would do that. I mean, back in the day when we would be designing stuff for uh, the Mac or iOS, you use Interface Builder, right? And you just drag these things out and they run directly in a simulator and you're designing like exactly what you're going to get. And... I, I really want the web to get there in terms of it being that easy to to do this stuff. And it, it sounds like using some of these plugins, we can get pretty much the way there oh, or I, all the way. Absolutely. I think um, Sketch, hasn't Sketch just announced that they are going to move Sketch into the browser as well? Um, right. So there you go. You, you literally, I think it's already in an actual app. Uh, so it's already based on the uh, the technology that will end up serving, and uh, they're just moving it into the browser now, which makes it sort of closer to that idea. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I'm wondering too, just how do we get to the point? I know we've talked about a couple of tools just in advance of this episode, but how do we get to that point where people are designing 
entire pattern libraries, A, I think helping their process of making sure that nothing gets missed and they're thinking about all the 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 components and molecules and atoms or whatever the, the breakdown is um, that they need, but then doing it in a way that can easily be ported into a real application. Are there tools out there that are doing that today? Um, yes, there, there's actually a, a bunch of them. I would say, and to uh, Andrew's point earlier, um, things like Interplay app uh, actually mm. doesn't come with one of those things that you can only use React. It actually says you can use whatever library they're supporting, Angular and Vue and whatever, um, nice. and you can put your thing in there. And uh, it's very much geared for uh, designers. And what gets me really excited about this is that because it, it lets you import tokens and the tokens basically make it make a change to your color picker on the right. And you can create a topography scale and all these kind of things that actually make a difference to the designer's interface when they are building or designing their uh, components. Which now means that a developer doesn't just build components for the clients that will see it in the end. They will also create their components for the designer that is using them to to create new you know views and whatever. So a, a tool that we've spoken about briefly before is called Figma, right? And that's essentially something kind of like Sketch, but in the browser. How would you differenti- differentiate Interplay? Uh, from uh, Figma, for instance. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to find an analogy there, but I think Figma is, and I'm not a designer, right? Like, I'm, I know as much from design process because I'm working a lot with designers. Um, All right, let's get them off the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Please leave us a review on iTunes. No. Oh. All right, oh. I'll talk to you guys later. All right, no, sorry. Go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Figma, I believe, is more the idea of creating something from scratch, whereas Interplay is very much about there's a design system, there's a component lab, uh, library in the back, and you're just using it. You can create your own thing and, and putting things in right. between, but it's very much geared towards the design system, which includes a couple default uh, design systems like uh, Shopify's Polaris. Um, or Mm -hmm. the Seek's design system. But then you can make your own and import it, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think that should be the end goal. Um, You should have, you should uh, sit in an ecosystem, a company, whatever it is, where you work with designers and developers together to have this design system and then create your new designs based on that because it's all about you know, consistency and trying to work together. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I I have not used this app, but to me, it, it looks more like, uh, an interface builder than just a free form design tool. Exactly. Exactly. So it's sort of like what you were saying for iOS. Right. Go ahead, Patrick. No, I was going to say, I, I suddenly want something where I like give it an SSH key and it can then push to get and update some React components up in my repo and I get to, or my designers can work on something they feel comfortable with, but it just outputs, you know, a, a button component or a table component or whatever it might be into real code and just the two systems talk to each other. I don't know if there's anything doing something like that, but that's something that I didn't know I wanted, but now I really want. Um, Yeah, it's, oh man, Um, that could be, (laughs) um, feels like we've been there a couple of times before where we Mm -hmm. did with Dreamweaver. Uh, We are having like a, exactly right. And (laughs) my impulses have brought me back to Dreamweaver. (laughs) Thanks a lot. So we... (laughs) We're coming back to uh, auto-generated code, which is probably not going to work out. I'm not 100% sure on this, but it does work if you have if you build your code based on code you've written. So basically on components. Mm. That's mm. it. That's so, how does, story. Yeah. so how does uh, one thing we were talking about previously was Storybook before the episode. Uh, I noticed Storybook says it works with Vue, works with React. Does it... it have you kind of supply the components up front and then you bring it in and style it up and then it, it outputs or how does that work? If, I believe if you can speak to is, it. Yeah, I believe story, we haven't used Storybook for a while, um, mm-hmm. but I believe Storybook is just a documentation of your patent library. It's like a website yeah. that allows you to see all the different patents that you have. Got it. 
Okay. Ways. So, uh, Patrick, the, the best analogy I can come up with is that storybook is kind of like a combination of documentation and then also code pen for mm. your components. Okay. You know, because you can you can see them, you can see the properties that it can render and you can see it in its different states. But it's really more of like a documentation thing. It's it's something that, you know, if, if we had a component library and we had it up in storybook, it's something that other developers would then use to pull in and and figure out how to how to style various things. Got it. Got it. Does that sound about right, Dominic? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So that's a tool that you would could actually use in conjunction with something like Interplay. Like they the these are tools that you probably would use together and there's not a ton of overlap in terms of who would be using them, right? Yeah. I mean Sure, I I can see um, from when um, Storybook and and these self documenting things came out, uh, I got excited because it gave developers a tool to push back to designers to say, well, actually, this thing already exists in a different um, button. It gave you an overview of all the different things that already existed, and uh, designers right. would often just reinvent the wheel over and over again, whereas developers are very dry focus, don't repeat yourself. And that would right. give them the ability to say, well, actually this thing that does what you just did already exists and it's here and you've done it a while ago. And that's that's good. It's like, to me, design systems in general, and this is something I should have preferenced, is it makes it easier or it's all about working together between designers and developers, trying to bridge that gap between designers and developers. And mm-hmm. it, that creates a lot of empathy. And that's really great because... It is hilarious that we are working, designers and developers are working exactly to the end, same end goal, but often don't even see each other or have, right. have no communications whatsoever. Yeah. Right. And so in your role at ThinkMill, has the introduction of tooling like this actually made for happier developers, happier designers, people feel like they're, the handoff is that much easier and everyone's kind of working together a bit better? It definitely has. I would mm. I would say happiness is in this case not the goal. It's more that the outcome is more mm-hmm. consistent and we actually understand each other. As in like a designer will have to understand why certain constraints exist in the development world, whereas a developer needs to understand why certain things are important, like uh, topography. There's, it's, it's a huge area, right? And we need to sort of understand what that means and to implement it correctly. And that spreading that knowledge and spreading that concern is uh, really valuable to the end product and the end user's experience. In the days before these tools were uh, widely adopted, it seems like that there was always a lot more frustration Uh, during development because you would have misunderstandings and then you would have already developed something and then the designers come back and ask you to rework it. And it's just, it's just like a lot of frustration all around where it kind of smooths out some of that development process. Exactly. A hundred percent. That's, that's like, I I agree. It's got a lot to do with happiness, (laughs) but it also has a lot to do with the frustration of uh, you designing something and you have something in mind and it's hard to communicate because you're, two-dimensional design PDF that you're handing over actually doesn't allow for interactions. And the interaction is really important about this specific element. Um, And you're just going to annotate it or something. And that leaves things up for um, imagination. That's more right. that way. It's kind of like that old book, right? Uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus or whatever. <laughs> in, in terms of designers, <laughs> well, in terms of like designers and developers, right? A lot, of, I've, I've heard a lot of... Um, you know, you'll be in the design department and the designers will be like, oh, those freaking developers, you know. And then you go to the developer the development department and they'll be like, oh, those designers are crazy. You can't believe the, the stuff they handed me. And, and you're right, Dominic, anything that can kind of bridge the gap in terms of helping them, helping each person understand their role and the importance of it is probably going to make for a better end product, right? Yeah, that's right. And the and the product itself or the, the process actually forces you to sit together. So there's no, like in my opinion, there's no amount of tooling that will uh, make it possible for designers and developers to talk to each other without actually talking to each other. So it's not right. going to be the thing where you design something and you hand it over and it has so much meta information that the developer just knows what it is. That will, we, we are getting in into this direction, but we'll never fully get there. So a design system forces you to actually sit together in the same room 
or in the same hangout if you're remote and work through the details and talk about what is the problem here? What are we trying to solve? And what is your problem? And what are you trying to solve? And get there together. Well, I get I hear that a lot. People saying, well, what is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> so Dominic, if you can share, what does your process look like? You're, you're kicking off a project. Let's say it's a, a typical client site. They're doing business to business or business to consumer. Maybe they have an existing brand. They have some idea maybe of colors. But when you come in, how do you start to build a... A, a design system? How do you build a pattern library? What, what does that look like for anyone who's feeling like they could or should be bringing this into their own process? Yeah, that's a uh, that's actually a fantastic opportunity because <laughs> I love that stuff. Um, what, yeah, we, yeah. what often happens is that companies will actually come to us directly and ask us about design systems or creating a design system, helping them s uh, resurrect one of the design systems they already built. Mm. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that people forget when it comes to uh, building a design system. It's not about the first nine months. It's about the 18 years that follows after. <laughs> so it's there's a lot of that stuff. But if I come to a company that uh, asks me, hey, can we do a design system together? The very first thing is I uh, do a bunch of interviews with all the people that have a stake in it, uh, specifically mm -hmm to understand what the constraints of the company is, like what is the tech stack, what is the, the background uh, of deployment. And there's there's always a couple of things that you have to remember that you wouldn't guess from the outside. But then also talk about, talk to the designers and understand uh, what is the brand situation currently? Where does the source of truth of brand sit and who wants mm -hmm. to own this, et cetera. And then we grab a bunch of people from both sides and I just want to acknowledge there's more than two sides to design systems, but we'll get that get there later. And uh, we will actually do a, a website audit or an interface audit. So you'll go mm -hmm. through all the interfaces that the company has and, and basically print them out and cut them all up into little components and make sh uh, and trying to identify the common components that we want to put into the design system and where maybe the same component or like two different components do exactly the same thing and trying to mesh them up. Uh, one of the banks that I worked with, when we did this first, we had, I believe, 36 different buttons that all did exactly <laughs> the same thing. And it's it's that's a material impact, right? There were 36 different projects with 36 different designers and 36 different developers that all reinvented the button. And I know this is, mm -hmm. this is uh, an old chestnut, to always talk about buttons, but it's a perfect example of what we should be doing because 25 of them weren't accessible and a bunch of others weren't even close to the brand guidelines and mm -hmm. so on and so forth because every project is under the constraints of uh, a delivery how deadline. Do you, how do you get to 25 buttons? 36. Uh, 36. Good question. 30, how do you get it's, to 36 buttons? By, by having a lot of different siloed processes in a really big mm. company. I'm that, sure someone's on bootstrap, someone's on foundation, someone has an iframe thing that can't be CSS. Yeah. To, like, there's got to be so many ways. Everybody's doing that. their own thing. Exactly. Yeah. But that's that's really exciting. Like even thinking about that particular example, if you have an iframe, like there's a there's a constraint now, like I can't use mm -hmm. HTML yep. or there's something, maybe a security related thing. And now I get to, as an engineer, I get excited because I look at this and say, okay, there's a problem that I can solve. There's a thing that I can mm -hmm. now look at to, to make it work for both uh, or three or four different use cases. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I have to think that once you do that, once you've taken all these these buttons and put them all out and divorced them from the context and from the content, people probably can't even tell which was the buy button, which was the yeah. primary, which was the secondary. And, and you know, I, I think about a site like Amazon, or you know, they they have a handful of button styles, but you pretty much like a dog whistle. You see that kind of orangish Amazon buy button, and it stands out from the rest of the page and they, they know that that's going to drive conversion and, and there there's no page that really deviates from that. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. We, we're not doing design systems because we, we like to create new problems, although we do. Um, <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> we, we create design I, systems. I got enough problems already, Dominic. Don't make, don't make more. Ah, uh, that's just please. human. <laughs> um, <laughs> we create design systems to actually solve an end user problem. 
design systems are for mm. people, as Gina Anna says. It's all about saying that uh, what we're trying to get out of is a website that is consistent so that when you surf through your website, you don't need to understand there's lots of different projects that are responsible for some parts of it and not other parts. And you don't have to onboard people in the user experience because they have to understand now this button works this way and the other button has like a pop-up and works completely different or you have to slide it or something. Yeah. It's it's very much geared towards the end result of a user experience needs to be better and understandable. And, and that's so point. that's so important. I know that I've said this before, I think, on this podcast, that you know, everyday folks using a site are not trained designers, but they can still look at something that like what you were talking about, where you have this chaotic jumble of different styles um, and sense that something isn't quite right about it. And like the mm. uh, the example I think of is using way too many different typefaces. I see this a lot. So maybe someone can't look at, at your site and say, wow, I can't believe he used three different serifs and there's two different sans serifs, but they can look at it and they can sense like there's some disorder going on here. And so it really does affect end users when uh, when design is, is chaotic like that and not reined in with any kind of consistency or plan. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right, Jonathan, that your your average user, they can't tell you how to fix it, but they can tell you they something's wrong. They can tell you wrong. it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then Absolutely. for sure. But so, so John, Jonathan, you use, what is it, XD or something like I that? Do. Do I do. I do. So, and, and I'm... I'll, admittedly, I'm using XD right now just out of convenience um, because I. That's Adobe it's XD. Adobe right? XD, yeah. So this is experience design, and so this is kind of Adobe's mm. answer to a little bit of what we're talking about here with design systems. So they've they've introduced that recently in XD, where you can create uh, reusable component libraries, buttons, uh, he- headings, you know, paragraph. Text. Are you actually using it? To I do, do that actually, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. what I do is when I start, um, mocking up projects, I usually do the wireframes in XD and then I'll do the final designs and then I'll start looking at, um, components, uh, after about one or two pages that are, uh, similar and I'll start making, um, symbols is what they call them in XD so that I can easily drag these from my library onto a, a page that I'm, that I'm working on. And then if I ever need to make a change later, I can just update that symbol and then it globally updates that component uh, throughout XD. And then it works similar to um, if anybody's ever received a mock-up in the Envision um, or something like that. So you can can upload like a prototype. You can prototype user interactions, um, things like Uh, that. Some of those previews are so bad. What is it? What's bad? I, I don't know. It must be, I don't know if it's Envision or XD or something, but I've been given links to previews of designs. And there's just like, it's just, I don't know, just, it's never right. Yeah. I mean, it's always a little, it's always a little off because it can't scale with your screen. So if it's not, if the design isn't exactly right, like what is, I think the interactions help a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) I think, I think being able to see, and actually the reason that I do it is it's helpful in showing the client um, because they can actually Mm. pull it up in their browser. It's good enough for them to be able to see, ah, this is kind of what my page is going to look like in a browser. I can click on this link and see this modal overlay that you've described to me. This is how it's going to work. This clears up a lot of confusion when you're trying to communicate ideas to clients, uh, I've found. So anyway, I use XD. I've used UX Pin. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that one before. It has a similar idea behind, you know, building out design systems and having reusable components. But those are the other things. Yeah. One thing that you said that I I really love, Jonathan, is that it can be easy to think, okay, I'm going to build a, a component library. So I'm going to start in divorced of any other context. I'm going to come up with my button styling or my type or headings or other treatments away from what a page looks like. But I think that can be really hard to do. I, I, I We do the same thing where we, we come up with an entire page and try to feel it out and then try to say, okay, where are we doing buttons again and again? Let's then almost like do DRY coding, but after the fact, yeah. rather than trying to come up with your scaffolding first and, and then put it all together. Sometimes you just need to get it onto a page, see how it looks, see if it all gels together and then find the patterns put that into, you know, think about coding almost like something that's a little bit more dry. That That's always been something that this worked for us. Absolutely. And I think that there's a temptation sometimes to, to start abstracting things out prematurely. I sort of think about this like, um, I don't know if anybody uses Tailwind. I'm a huge fan. 
Uh, but but uh, oh, yeah. basically the way Tailwind works is you can start stringing all of these utility classes together when you're working on something. Well, let's say you you get like you build up you know ten or twelve classes uh, uh, to form your button. So what you can do is if you start seeing that you're repeating this all over the place, you can use a directive called apply, add apply, and you can extract those classes out into a reusable one. I sort of think about my design process that way. So as I start working on these pages, I, I work exactly like Patrick described, and I think it's a good way to do it. Work on one or two pages as you start seeing that you're reusing components, start extracting those out into um, into reusable um components in your design system. And that makes you a better designer because then you're being more consistent as you're working on these other pages. You're not sort of creating all these different various styles. You're pulling from a component library that has consistency. Mm -hmm. well, I, I want to give Dominic the opportunity of a lifetime. Are you ready for it, Dominic? Wow. <laughs> so you're going to, you're going to play God here. So you're, you're walking into Melville digital design and you've got a couple of developers, you've got a couple of designers. They're all absolutely fantastic at what they do. And amazingly, and this is absolutely amazing, none of them have any biases in terms of any tools that they like to use. And none of them have any baggage whatsoever, right? You're going to set them up with tooling that they're going to use to design and develop web apps. What are you going to give them? Sounds like the opportunity of my lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, no, no baggage also means that I now have a way too big creative space and I can do so many things. I would, you can have them designing on pink elephants if you want, like anything, whatever. Ah, let's see. That's another opportunity that I actually, I actually consider. Um, I think my preference would be React ecosystem, we create uh, a React com uh, component library, essentially, that can uh, is built in a way that allows me to feed into native as well as into uh, the web uh, it, via React Native, that then is ingested in uh, Interplay. So the designers are using it to create new views and new designs uh, from that source of truth that we've created. And mm -hmm. uh, it's all uh, published through NPM. It's all uh, in one big monorepo with lots of different workspaces. So some of them are like the core components. And then we make distinctions between specific maybe brand sections that the company has. There's a lot of these. Like maybe there's a marketing uh, heavy um uh, type components uh, and so on and so forth. And then I'd be really interested in creating a an email uh, sort of pattern library that makes it easier when you have to send emails out because that's still a thing. Ugh. We are <laughs> consistent and we don't have to deal with all the, you know, the, writing HTML for emails is interesting. Horrible. Um, oh my God. Oh my yeah. God. Oh. You don't want to deal with that anymore. So you, I, I basically create uh, a pattern library for emails and uh, the patterns can be quite uh, big because there's not that many emails that you're going to send out. We can actually have like four or five different templates. You just have to fill right. in for whatever use case. And, so so um, you're tooling, if I, if I got this correct, I just want to recap, make sure I'm keeping up. So we've got React and we're designing the styles in such a way that they can be used both by React on the web and React Native, right? And then we're putting this all in a NPM mono repo and we're tying it all to, and we're bringing it all into Interplay. Is that right? Yeah. All right, so that's our that's our tooling. Now, are you talking about a mono repo that you would then have different sections for different clients? In other words, would there be stuff that would be shared between companies? Because how different is the basics of a button? If, or are you talking about a different mono repo for every single company that comes along? Um, uh, on that, I actually have a, a draft and notes thing in my in my iPhone that I want to. Uh, it's like one of those things where I'm putting notes down what I'm going to write a blog post about. And the one that is right on the top is the title is how many times can you reinvent the button? The answer may surprise yeah. you. Okay. So yes, you, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of components that will, because we sort of settled as an industry on what UX in on the web is. There's a, there's mm. a couple, you know, variants, sure. But uh, there's a lot of, 
like we all understand sort of what a modal is. We understand what a select dropdown is. We know what buttons look like. There's right. differences in the design and appearance, which can be easily altered. But there's then also things that go a little bit crazier, as in like a date picker. I don't want to open that can mm. of worms, but date pickers are uh, an unsolved problem, if you will. <laughs> um, or well they've been solved many many times yes right? so many times that we're it's all a, confused it's an oversolved it. problem <laughs> yeah. yeah um and there's there's uh, lots of other things that um go into this category where even a button can become uh, really difficult because you have to now solve for uh, animations because you click on it as an async uh, function and you now need to give the user some feedback that something is happening so you need a spinner in there or you have a button that needs to merge in color and space to something else because you have like a two click thing where you say, yes, I agree. And the next click is you going to the next view. There's, there's so many different things that creating this one button that does all of them probably over engineers the button. Right. Yeah. You know, I hear all of this and I'm of a couple of minds, right? So on the one hand, I think something that makes the web super awesome is that tons of different people can reinvent the the wheel to do whatever they want, right? And, and that kind of monkeys at a typewriter thing can result in some pretty fantastic stuff, right? On the other hand, part of me is just like, why is everyone wasting their time on this, right? So <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no, really. So I'm wondering if part of this might not be failings from or not failings, or, or something that the web standards bodies should address in that there should be certain components that are built in a very generic way into the web browser so that we're not reinventing some of this basic stuff all, all the time. Well, it used to be that way. I mean, it, it used to be that a select is a select is a select. Now, I mean, in the sense that you like Microsoft or Internet Explorer had their select and Safari had its select and it sort of right. matched the... The U, like OS 10 um, and match the OS 10 interface and Windows match theirs. But now you can change it. And so, but, I mean, it did so clearly that way. But clearly that's not what people want, right? right. People want to be able to create a design yeah. and, and have these buttons or drop downs or whatever styled however they want. So, you know, maybe what we really need are, are some of the very core abstract components built into the actual web standards in some way so that we're not all redoing it. like okay it's just as an example have any of you tried styling an upload button <laughs> yes <laughs> not in a while yeah but yes it's ridiculous every yeah. you have to vendor prefix it it's it's different everywhere it's ridiculous so dominic do you th do you think i'm crazy or do you think that some of this stuff that we people are constantly reinventing should become kind of like a bedrock on the web Oh, absolutely. And I think that's exactly where we come from. I think you've actually honed down exactly on the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on one hand, we want standardization. On the other hand, when we have standardization, there's so much difference between the standards and implementations in the browsers right. Right. that we are butting up against this problem. We have right. the same problem with like try to style a scroll bar. Mm -hmm. Right. That was that was a thing for a while that we did. And we and I don't know if you remember, I'm old, but that's uh, one of the things that um, browser platform engineers actually created and then sort of lost interest in. And now we have ended up with this sort of half-baked styling API that is different in different browser implementations and it became frowned upon and so on and so forth. Like acknowledging the fact that the W3C's process is slow by design and that there's a lot of, like, we can't really rely on hoping that the platform adopts specific patterns or specific uh, UX things that we are settling on. For us to settle on things, we need to try things out. And for us to not reinvent the wheel every single time, we need to create design systems. So at least in a company, we're not doing that. Between companies, we're probably doing it. Hmm. But one thing that I've noticed in the design system community is that there's a lot of designers, engineers sharing their code and work and research freely, even between companies that are in very hostile competition, which is, which is awesome. It's sort of like the Wild West uh, where um, on the surface, we're all just fighting but underneath all the people that are actually doing the work are all just best friends and doing the thing mm. but yeah i'm i'm 
I'm saying like the process of getting to the standardization is probably exactly what we're doing by, by creating these patent libraries, by creating these frameworks to then sort of settle and say, well, okay, for instance, React Select is probably a good example of it's, it's hard enough to think about this problem and hard enough to engineer any of these things to not reinvent it anymore because right. someone has done it now and let's not touch it anymore because it's freaking hot. Yeah, it's really tough. It's really tough because you you if I come from the iOS and, and Mac development world, I mean, that's very top down, right? Apple's like, here's your stuff, right? You get interface builder, you lay your stuff out. Yes, you can make your own custom stuff, sure. But it's very top down in terms of what is made available to you. And then you look at the web and it's just like, it's crazy. You know, it, it reminds me of the uh, time-lapse photos of like a Petri dish with just stuff like just growing out of control <laughs> all over the place. You know what I mean? And some amazing innovations come from that. And it's such a tough balance. Like, okay, so if we made some of this stuff available as a standard, are, are then the developers going to chafe against it and say, no, we, you know, we really... You know what I mean? Like, it's a really tough balance to do that. But I also, at some point, there's just only so much that you benefit from reinventing the wheel that many times. You know what I mean? I mean, it just, it gets insane. I, I look at, Dominic, you talk about being old, and I look at some of the build processes that are going on these days, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I remember doing that with Make, like, 30 years ago. <laughs> you know, like... This stuff has been around for a really long time, and yeah, and we are we are settling, right? I think yeah. what you're pointing out there is really interesting. the The process of the W3C is slow by design because their philosophy is not to break the web with additions, right? So right. you can still, and that was a thing because the web just turned thirty years. Right. Uh, you can still uh, visit the very first website of the CERN. Uh, thing and it still all works in a modern browser and that's that's just a constraint they have to deal with which leads to a lot of duplicated improved api surface i guess uh and they also need to think about if there's a framework that has implemented something similar already they can't make that change now because that'll break a lot of websites that already exist so it's a super hard mm. thing to do but it is very much the space of design systems. It's engineering, thinking about designers and designers trying to get in there. The, the Jen Simmons and uh, a couple of these uh, fantastic people that have implemented the CSS grid specs into mm. the W3C right. uh, is exactly that. It's designers trying to work with engineers or platform engineers in this case to to create something that will benefit everyone and it'll take ages and they have to go through this very technical process but it is this merge of the two concerns designs and development and in one way that they were the w c3 or w3c was trying to solve this is a technology called houdini right so yeah. houdini was a browser technology that in theory allowed you or allowed developers to extend what CSS and the browser's rendering engine can do, right? You can just extend it. If you want to start using something immediately, you don't have to wait for certain things to be implemented. And my understanding, and I'm, I may be incorrect on this, but my understanding uh, from uh, talking to Eric Meyer about this is that they chose a very different way to roll out Grid than they did Flexbox. And I think that they were using some of what they learned by implementing Houdini to roll that stuff out, which is where they basically allowed the browsers to implement all of this stuff, um, but you had to set certain flags in order for stuff to work, right? And you didn't have the same issue with Flexbox of like hundreds, of, you know, not, not hundreds, but dozens of different versions and various levels of brokenness here and there. I wonder if some system like Houdini to allow them to extend functionality of JavaScript or of the basic browser is something that uh, is a direction that we could go in. Because, I mean, at some point, Dominic, can you envision some of the core features that both React, Vue, and Angular all solve? Can you imagine that being built into or baked into a browser in some way? Well, I would say that uh, Web Components is trying to do that. Right. 
So it's it's like I think the the common threat between all these frameworks that you mentioned is probably the componentization and mm -hmm. the thinking behind how you how you split off your UI uh, into reusable chunks, uh, very much back to Brad Frost's atomic design sort of thing. Yeah. And then also the idea of this virtual or shadow DOM, whatever DOM. Yeah. That's um, what does it for me, because I think components have been around for a really long time. But the line, the distinction that I draw between, you know, some of these more modern front end libraries is the reactivity and just that way of thinking about things, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, a, I have a completely different source of truth that is completely uh, reduced to the to the small thing that you're doing, completely irrelevant of uh, what it looks like uh, and just work with that and crunch the data and making sure that you only make changes to the thing that has changed and however that feeds up exactly. So I think Vue and React and Angular, they probably have more in common than they have different in terms of some of the problems that they're trying to solve and some of the fundamental ways that they work. And I just wonder if at some point, we're not going to get this distilled down into a browser application platform that people can still build, you know, their flavor of the day on top of, but we'll take care of some of these more mundane things that all of these frameworks have in common and give us a common base as an application deployment platform that we can count on. I mean, I would love to see something like that. I think that's exactly how the W3 sees this. Um, uh, they just need to allow enough time because in JavaScript world, there's a new framework every two seconds or something. Oh, yeah. And they, they can't adopt something that uh, is just the flavor of the day, right? They right. need to wait for the community to settle on something. And if you think about it, React has been around for, what, five years? Mm -hmm. um, that's not a very long time when you think about the web being 30 years old. It's not a long time, but then it, it also feels like forever. Yeah, for us, because we are used <laughs> to all these changes. Yeah. Uh, we are used to the new framework coming up every single day. Sure. Right. But uh, yeah, it's the fluctuation. There's like, I, I absolutely embrace this. Um, I love the fact that we we can try all these different things. And as, as a community, we will settle at some point because we are lazy by nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, good. Good developers are lazy, and we will at some point say, well, I just don't want to reinvent the, the select anymore. I don't right. want to do any of this because I already know what the answer is. We've been through this for two years. We could no, it's not an interesting challenge to solve. It's not, yeah. I mean, you know, it, we, we <laughs> at some point we can get past it, and it, here's your button. You know what I mean? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that I really want to um, talk about is the this idea of tokens and this abstraction uh, in combination specifically with um, utility first classes, because obviously Simon has started with Thinkmill and has been obviously railing his troops about <laughs> uh, utility first classes. And I believe we found this really beautiful sweet spot between tokens and utility first classes that doesn't have this, um, I want to say, PR problem. <laughs> Talk to me about tokens. I want to hear it. Yeah. So the the way we handle or um, work with a multi-platform framework is we abstract the design aspect of it or the styling aspect of it into a, I don't want to say new language, but it's a different language that doesn't tie the use case to CSS or the use case to iOS or Android or whatever else you're using. And um, we're trying to describe basically the main, most important things, spacing, color, shadows, uh, these types of things in, in tokens uh, that lives above a design system and describes in a very abstract way what your digital brand is. And that also allows us to use them in the components. So when we create and develop these components, we just say, hey, give me the token for the for the semantic color that stands for action and give me the f shade 50, whatever. And that sounds very similar to uh, utility first classes, right? Mm -hmm. you, it does. You, you're starting to use uh, the thing that is defined in, uh, in general and putting it in there without actually having classes, without actually having this aftertaste that feels a bit still weird to some of us to have like 20 classes on a thing because we feel like that's a better way. We're doing it 
inside the composition of uh, our components, whether that be Vue or React or Preact or whatever else. And what comes out is a single class because we're using CSS and JavaScript that is all just comprised of all these different tokens. And you still have only one source of truth for the action color. And you may change, you may change it once there in, in the tokens and it'll feed all the way down to the shadow of a silly button on the left. Hmm. So you're saying you, you essentially have developed your own tokenized language and you pass these in as properties to a component and then it will spit back out the CSS that's needed to generate that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It's either use it's either generating out CSS or it's generating out the styling information that we need in React Select uh, in React Native, sorry, or it spits out whatever else we need. But it becomes the abstracted source of truth. So where where is the the dictionary for this? We'll call it uh, TMSS, right? For ThinkMill style sheet. Where is uh, the action? Sorry. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> we didn't really come up with this. This is something that uh, Salesforce really uh, started with. Uh, no, no, I, they... I don't care. It's it's ThinkMill SS. It's TMSS. <laughs> all right. It's all good. Claim ownership on it. You can even use the little TM sy sy uh, symbol. So it can be TMSS TM, right? Where does this source of truth live and what is it? Is it like a JavaScript file where you just have an object with constants or key value pairs? Or like, what is this thing? That is exactly what it is. How good is it that you can guess this without, like, it's not super complicated. <laughs> yeah. It's um, it's basically like a JSON object. We're using JavaScript because we will want to repeat or uh, reference uh, certain variables. So you can't mm -hmm. do it directly in JSON or right. not in JSON uh, in the current specs of the JSON, but you can, um, what you're getting out is an object and you have yeah. like an object. I, I, that I call that JSON-ish. Yeah, right? sure. So when, when you're so. writing JavaScript that looks like JSON, but it's not <laughs> JSON because you really need access to JavaScript, it's JSON-ish. Exactly. Right? And we can Sorry, go ahead. we can lots of we can add lots of stuff in there. We we the organizing is usually and I'm trying to get them right now. It's like four different uh, aspects of this. You have topography, you have spacing, you have uh, color, you have you have iconography, and the last there was a fifth one actually. Um, I want to say grid, mm -hmm. and uh, those are the five things that you distill your information into, and you just say the color. You're probably going to describe it in hex because uh, X is easy to convert to anything else. Uh, and you probably don't need um, opacity information, even though you could, if you wanted to. You you speaking in points or in, in like a unitless uh, spacing language mm -hmm. uh, that will then be translated to, I don't know, something that is dividable by four pixels or M's or REMs or whatever you're using in CSS, that's up to you. Sure. Or it's points uh, in iOS or whatever else that you want to take. So it's, it's very similar to CSS. Uh, it's not much really that you have to learn. It's like, I I want to say it's pretty obvious when you look at it. Okay, but let, let me just, to make sure that I'm understanding how this works. So let, let's say that in your JSON-ish object, you've got a alert property, right? So uh, components need to have an alert state, right? Right. Let's say that down the road, a couple of months later, I want. I need to add a red alert state to this thing. How are components then? Or where is the responsibility in them being able to implement this new thing that I've just added? Yeah. So if you're adding a new thing, it's pretty easy because um, we're making a distinction between global tokens and local tokens. But that's that's more detailed now than we probably need to get. But if you're adding a new thing, you're just creating a new component then that has a new version, probably a major version or minor, I guess, because you're adding a feature and uh, that uses this new token. And the token is usually a package that we uh, include. So it'll be on a new version of, of the token package. Okay. But the token package doesn't break any of the previous components because we just added something. It's more interesting to think about what happens if you actually make a change and how do okay. we deal with what is a major break and what is a minor break in CSS. That's a very interesting thing because only even a pixel change can mean that things that don't wrap properly anymore and maybe they fall into a pit where they're get, getting out of line and they are now in in a space that you can't see them anymore so that for instance the cancel button suddenly doesn't appear anymore because it's in 
all of your hidden areas. Uh, and that is a break, right? So does it mean that anything that I make changes to in CSS automatically means it's a major change? I'm not going to answer this because <laughs> um, there's there's a lot of different ways of thinking about this and every single company comes up with a different a theming of how to break things. But it's really right. important to think about this. How do we break things? How do we make sure and manage expectations of when we, when we make a change in design system and want to enable us to make as many changes as possible and rapidly grow and do the thing? Mm. So do this is going to sound completely crazy, but... I'm just doing it, doing it live on air, you know, as I'm <laughs> listening to you and I'm thinking about it and it almost, rem it almost reminds me of what can be done with object inheritance in a number of different languages in that, let, let's say you had this design thing that was in a, a class, right? Mm -hmm. And each of these various properties like alert and red alert were just methods that that class implements, right? And it can, the class itself can just return whatever makes sense in a generic way to return something from it. But then any component that is based off of that class could then override any of those methods to do kind of exactly what it wanted to do from styling. Sure. Does that make sense at all? Yeah. So if it makes sense, how come you're not doing it? <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's harder to implement. Um, classes are really just syntax, uh, syntactical sugar in, in JavaScript, right? But yeah, we're essentially doing exactly the same thing with, okay. with different mechanisms. It's like you we're using it via the NPM ecosystem and making sure that we use Semver, I guess. That's sort of the contract that we have in between. Right. Well, at some point, classes in JavaScript are going to end up being more than sugar, right? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe I'm, not. Maybe I'm not. not sure. You never like know. It. There's a there's a camp that doesn't like it. There's a camp that really loves them. It's uh, it's an interesting thing to be watching. Yeah. Yeah, we got we got camps everywhere. I mean, that's <laughs> that's part of the problem is is getting everyone to agree to a, a a direction that is reasonable enough, right? And then the the W3C like we're talking about, they kind of have to move slowly and they're always going to move at a speed that is too slow for developers, right? So yes. I think there's always going to be this churn. I don't think there's ever a destination on this highway that we're on. You know what I mean? Like I just everyone's like, "Oh, you know, I can't wait until the JavaScript framework stabilize, or I can't wait until CSS, you know, this, that, or the other thing. And from my point of view, that's just never coming. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is, there is no destination. This is just, we're constantly going down this highway and there's constantly going to be new technologies and new ways of doing stuff. I don't think there is a destination. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent agree. That's, that's exactly what it is. It's, uh, it's us trying to iterate over and over again. We are basically the guinea pigs. And yeah. the platform engineers are the ones that uh, uh, use the observation of what we've been doing and trying to implement the standard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, what do you think about all this stuff? Are you interested in trying out some of these uh, new tools that he's talking about in terms of maybe maybe looking at Interplay, which, by the way, for my old age, is an old game development company, oh, Interplay? I them, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I love playing with new tooling mm -hmm. and um, new uh, ways of doing old processes. So Interplay looks great. I think it looks really beautiful. It looks like it's an actual app, right? Like you can download this and run this, not in your browser. It's like a, a real standalone application, it looks like. I don't think it is but just so. yet, but they will probably get to it because everything that can go in Electron will go in Electron, right? Yeah, but to some yeah. extent, you're going to want to run it in your browser anyway, though, right? Because you're going to be running, you know, React, Vue, Angular, you know, whatever. And you, you want to see the actual thing rendered by the actual browser, don't you? Oh, yeah, I agree. I just I went to their website and they have it inside of like the, the Mac OS GUI looking. But anyway, but yeah, so that one looks really pretty. There's like a ton more that I haven't played with that I'd love to play with. So, yeah, I'll probably download a few today. Yeah, and the, the distinction is being blurred anyway. I think the, the new Chrome lets you save anything that's a PWA. It lets you save it as a desktop app on your Mac. You just, well, that's true. You just, you just launch it, right? Yeah. Just like you've yeah. been able to do on the, the home screen for iOS and then also on Android yeah. for forever. You know? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it's a exciting times. I think these design tools, 
uh, exactly what Jonathan said in the beginning. They, for designers, it's exactly just trying to make it easy to show a thing to a client or to the developer or anything else. Mm. And as as close as we can get to production code or the source of truth that we'll be using in the end after that, the better we are uh, selling ourselves or selling the thing. Yeah. I think we've all been in the situation where we feel like we're prototyping something in production code, which is just awful. Mm-hmm. So like you start making, having back and forth, oh, change it. Oh, what do you think about this? You know, that's that's not what you want to do. No, that's definitely not what you want to do. But you want to make it easy to create a prototype very, very quickly of the things that you already know and make it then easy to add new things. And that's exactly what a design system lets you. Well, that's really funny, Jonathan, because there there's a... A woman on Twitter, I don't remember who it was, but (laughs) this really stuck out. She's some kind of a a DevOps engineer or something like that. And her tagline was, I test in production and so do you. (laughs) I saw that. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Who who is that? Do you know who I'm talking about? It's going to be someone I follow. I I, I have a couple ideas, but I don't want to name the wrong person. Whatever. Uh, Whoever it ends up being. That's funny. Well, it's brilliant because it's totally true. Yep. I, I'm sorry. I mean, whether it comes to operating systems or web apps or whatever, like everyone's testing in production. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, that's just the way it works, you know? Yeah, I, I think that like the it's you're always going to have to. But the the sort of ideal that we all aim towards is to is to reduce the amount of that as much as possible. To, to give you an example. And Dominic, this is going to date me, but that's fine. I had a, a buddy of mine who was an engineer at Apple. And if anyone remembers, back in the day, Apple had these things called the XServe RAID. Does there anyone remember those at all? I actually worked on an XServe RAID one time. Okay. Yeah, so I, yeah I, own, I own a couple of them, whatever. But he was one of the engineers that was working on this thing, right? And they're getting ready to, to make the announcement and ship this thing. And uh, I think Jobs was back at the company. I don't know. Uh, but they were getting ready to do the announcement. And they switched it from development to <laughs> production, like the, the build. And it didn't boot anymore, right? That's it. Oh, Lord. It just didn't boot anymore. So what did they do, Dominic? Mm, panic. No. They left it in dev. They shipped it in dev. <laughs> they, 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 oh, are you serious? They put it wow. back into dev and they shipped it. I don't understand. I don't understand what didn't work. They just, what do you mean? It they, was probably timing related. You know, there's probably something in the, the debug code that just made things time just perfectly <laughs> so that it actually worked. Whereas... When they flipped it to production, it uh, it locked up when wow. it tried to boot it. So they shipped yeah. their enterprise grade server, yeah, dev in yeah. dev mode. Yep. Yeah, not related to the dev mode.fm <laughs> podcast <laughs> <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. But it, it's just showing you, and there, you know, I've got dozens of stories from all sorts of big companies, big and small, that do this kind of stuff. We are all just trying to figure it out, and we are all iterating over the same problems and just hoping to to get to better solutions, right? When I hear stories like that, it makes me feel better about some of the dumb things. That <laughs> <I do. laughs> about yeah. some of the testing you've done in production, Jonathan? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Dominic, thank you very much for coming on here. I think this has been absolutely fantastic. I feel like we could talk about like all sorts of different things for a really long time. (laughs) Um, But I think that about wraps it up for this episode of the devmode.fm podcast. To have every episode delivered to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our RSS or subscribe via iTunes or Google Play. And yes, it is actually true now that (laughs) that we are actually on Stitcher and we're actually on Spotify now. When Patrick announced it the other week, like he was lying, he was making stuff up. Yeah, yeah, I just was speaking yeah. and thinking, you know, magical thinking about where I want to be. But now we're there. Yeah, you were testing on production. A little it's bit, a okay. little bit. Yep, yep. And if you like what we're doing, leave us a review. You can also follow us on Twitter at devmode.fm, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Leave us a comment on the devmode.fm website. For the devmode.fm podcast, I'm Andrew Welch. I'm Jonathan Melville. I'm not Jonathan, but he dropped off, so I'm going to pretend to be Jonathan, but I am Patrick Harrington. And thank you very much, Dominic, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me.
this one's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a nightmare. So, Dominic, I think, I think there are cars driving past your apartment or wherever you live. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, and I got the drop.